Thank you. I'd like to open this morning reading from Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 14 and 16, and also from Revelation, the third chapter, verse 20. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come. I will come to him and eat with him, and he with me. Let us stand together. And join together and call the Lord to remain standing for the hymn and the doxology. The Holy One calls our sons and our daughters to prophecy. Be ready. The Holy One calls our young people to see visions. The Holy One calls our elders to dream dreams. The Spirit of the Holy One is poured upon all flesh. Let's now join together singing hymn number 404. <laughs> Accept these gifts and offerings as evidence of the holy fire burning in our hearts. Amen. Amen.
concerns today. Neva Rex Road, uh, Marie Pitsenbarger, uh, Joan and Roger Ashley, also Mary Hedrick, uh, Mary Linda Hedrick, uh, Mary's son Glenn had another massive heart attack this week and it was their intentions to drive and see him today. So let's, let's pray for that family. And I can't remember the boy's name. There was a four wheeler accident yesterday too. Was it a Hess? Yes, yeah, that's the one. I'm not sure which one. Okay, so let's, let's pray for that family. I think he's doing okay. We haven't heard an update, so I'll okay. hear that. I think. Okay. Joe Mathias. Joe Mathias. All right. My niece, Diane Elliott yeah. in Maryland. Diane Elliott. <laughs> All right, let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we love you today and we're thankful that we can be in this place, uh, to be in your presence. Uh, just to take, take some time out to uh, glorify you. You do so much for us and uh, we know that we take it for granted. So Lord, just forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our shortcomings, and just help us as we go through life. For the names uh, spoken and unspoken, uh, we just place them before you as well. And we ask God that you will intervene in their lives in the only way that you can. Be with our world uh, for Ukraine, all that goes on there, and, and just everything that's going on uh, surrounding all of us. Help us to be your church. Uh, help us to be your so, Lord, just give us the words this day that we stand in need of and, and just mold us and shape us into your disciples. For it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. Mm -hmm. 
Scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost, but I want to read to you this before we read our scripture. <clears throat> it's Pentecost again, time to celebrate and give thanks. We sometimes say that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. An argument for that can be made, certainly. But we could also say that the church was born in a manger in Bethlehem or dripping wet in the Jordan River when a voice declared, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Or perhaps it was born in the gatherings of the crowds on the Galilean hillside listening to the teaching that seemed ancient and new at the same time. Or it was born when the eyes were opened and legs were straightened and the bleeding was stopped and even death gave way to power and presence. The church was born in a dark garden of betrayal and denial on a lonely cross on Golgotha, or from an empty tomb early one morning when the sun rose. Is Pentecost the birthday of the church? Maybe. Or maybe that's when the church learned to walk on its own. Maybe that's when, empowered by fire and wind, the church spoke on its own, but used words learned from the one who gave life. On Pentecost, we celebrate the coming of the church wind. Not what it says, right? <laughs> On Pentecost, we celebrate the coming of the Spirit to raise the church out of hiding and out of despair and to give the church wind at the back and fire in the bones and to encourage the church to proclaim, no, to live the good news of Jesus Christ outwardly and invitationally. Pentecost is also the beginning of the long season we sometimes call ordinary time. The word ordinary comes from ordinal, which means we count the Sundays. First Sunday of Pentecost, second Sunday of Pentecost, and so on. We don't mean ordinary as in the run of the meal and boring, same old, same old. No, in ordinary time, we are called, we are invited, we are equipped and empowered to live the spirit life. A life first lived by the one we call Lord. Jesus of Nazareth. We take the reins and we live for him, even as he lives in us. It's Pentecost again, time to celebrate and give thanks and to live the spirit life. And that's from a UMC Disciple webpage. So do our scripture in Acts chapter two, uh, starting at verse one. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost arrived. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <laughs> Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying one to the other, What does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter standing with the eleven lifted up his voice and addressed them. 
Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it, this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and my female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fires, vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God today for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Pentecost. What is it? What would it have been like to experience that first Pentecost? <clears throat> because as I read this scripture, it just said that they, they were gathered together in one place. Gathered together in one place when all of a sudden a sound came as a mighty rushing wind. Wonder what it what did it sound like? Did it just explode the doors? Did it blow out the windows? What do you think? The children's sermon I asked this morning, what, what does the wind sound like? So I'll ask you adults, what, what does the wind sound like? Well, it can't sound like a train 2,000 years ago. <laughs> What's it sound like? But if I ask you to make a noise of the train, what are you going to make? Your mouth's moving, but I'm... <laughs> Choo choo. Who, who? Choo choo. Choo choo. I don't know about choo choo. Choo choo down the track. What do you think? But not only winds, but it, it, it filled, filled the place. And then cloven, cloven tongues like fire came down and rested upon them. I asked the kids, what, what does fire sound like? You all don't do. What, what's fire sound like? If I, if I were to ask you to give me the sound of a fire, what is it? Crackling. Crackling. Some wood furling. I want you to make the sound. <laughs> I get more response out of little ones. <laughs> But this fire was different, right? The fire that we see here is not the same fire that we see that consumes something. But it rested upon them. And not only that, they began to prophesy. They began to preach the gospel. And for all these people who gathered in this place, from all these other parts of the world and had all these different languages, each one was able to hear in their own tongue this gospel. Pentecost, this, this Holy Spirit fire. But I wondered, I wondered, what if, what if this morning what if this morning the Holy Spirit was just taken away? It no longer existed. It happened today. I began to wonder, wonder how many churches would go to church and function like they always had. Because let's be honest, if the Holy Spirit was just automatically taken away we can't just go to church and function can we because the spirits are power as well right it's the spirit of God that leads us and guides us and directs us 
in the things of life. Because I can honestly tell you today that if the Spirit was not here, Mike would not be here. Because I can't. I don't have that ability. But still, some churches, and I'm, I'm not saying we're that, we could be. But we're, we're so caught up in doing what we do, we forget about the Spirit. I watched a movie, I think it was yesterday, I don't remember the name of it now, but it was about this mega church and they, they were doing all these things and uh, the youth pastor had was touring across the, the, the country and, and trying to proclaim the gospel, but at some venue somebody had threw up a beach volleyball and he had signed the volleyball and guess what happened? Everywhere he went, it was all about the volleyball and him him signing the volleyball and promote the church. But this church, not only that, they had decided that at Easter, they were actually going to crucify somebody. Matter of fact, they were going to crucify the youth pastor. And when I say literally, they were going to drive the, they had met with doctors and then figured out how they could sterilize, sterilize the nails and how they could drive it through his hands where it wouldn't kill him. But the long story is, long story of that all is simply this, they, they got so caught up in what they were doing and what they were about, they forgot about God. They had forgot about the Holy Spirit. They had forgot about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified. So what if, what if, what if the church today, what would happen if the Spirit was gone? It would die. But that's not the case. The Holy Spirit is still here. And the Holy Spirit should still burn like fire within all of us. Now I get it. I would love to stand here this morning and tell you that I'm always right here with the Holy Spirit. That I'm constantly filled, good to go, this, that, and other. And I probably could, but the big problem is simply this. Life happens. So if you're, you're like me, Sometimes I fluctuate, right? But I still know it's about the Spirit of God. Everything that we do here on Sunday morning is about the Spirit of God, and it's about the Spirit being present. Now, you could come and maybe not realize that, but that would be on you. In his book, it's entitled Spirit Rising, Tapping Into the Power of the Holy Spirit. It asks us to consider these questions. How many Christians suffer from a spiritual life that is dry and mechanical? How many Christians suffer from a life that's dry and mechanical? When I read that, I thought it this, interpreted it this way. How many of us come to church every Sunday just because that's what we do, right? It's Sunday. We think that somebody's going to come back and get us if we don't go to church. So we get up and we just go. And there are people, I've done it, okay? I'll make you feel, but I haven't done it since I started preaching. <laughs> You know, that's a, that's a one story, isn't it? Uh, uh, one morning, uh, mom uh, yells upstairs and tell her son, tells her son to get out of bed to go to church. And the uh, son answers and says, Mom, I'm not going. And he gives all these excuses. And his mom finally yells back and says, Yes, you are going to church this morning because you're the pastor. <laughs> But, I, but I've, I've done that. I, I, I've been at a place in life where I've gone to church and it's been dry mechanical. Numerous times. 
I've came to church and, and my intentions were, is a simple fact, I'm going to church, but I'm not going to like it and I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm going to church today. I don't like how Darla sings, so when she sings, I'm not going to like it. Or I'm going to church today, and whenever the preacher preaches, I don't like him. I, I've had, I've had, I've honestly had people tell me that that they they've had a pastor that they didn't like. Wasn't me though. <laughs> But they, they had a pastor that they haven't liked and they said that they've intentionally gone to church and that when he gets in the pulpit to preach that they just tune him out. I'm thinking, I just stayed home, you know? But that's what happens when, when, it, when it becomes dry and mechanical, we're still going to the motions. But that's not the Holy Spirit with fire, is it? The second question it asks is this, how many serve Jesus, whom they know about from the Bible, but who is not living, not a living reality in their, their experiences? How many people, how many people are there out there today that serve the Jesus of the Bible, but yet Jesus is not really real to them? Again, I don't know you, but I know Mike very well. I've done that. Much of my younger life, I went to church. I, I knew the Jesus of the Bible. I'm not the smartest person in the world, and you've come to realize that, and you should know that. But still, the way I was raised, I was taught about God. I knew Scripture. I was in these classrooms when they were all full. I, I was up there with teachers and every week it was memorized something. So I knew, I knew Jesus. I knew Jesus. And maybe it was still being dry and mechanical, but I was still going to church. And if you were to have known me at that time, you would have probably said I was in pretty good shape. But my biggest question when I, when I turned 18, 19, whatever age it was, my, one of my biggest questions was simply the fact, is Jesus real? Is he real? And he's real. And I've experienced that. That's why, you know, I recognize God's spirit. I, I recognize. I recognize where he's leading and where he's coming. Because you see, it's that spirit, number one, it's that spirit that convicts us of our sin and lets us know and helps us realize that we need a Savior. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. It's the Holy Spirit that takes us by the hand and it leads us to what maybe an altar like this or some place where we kneel down and we accept Christ as Savior. But it's also that Holy Spirit that con continues to, to live with inside of us and, and to guide us and direct us in all aspects of life. It's the Holy Spirit today that calls us to prayer. It's the Holy Spirit today that causes us to use our gifts to sing. It's the Holy Spirit that calls us today to proclaim the gospel. But for how many of us, is that real to you? It should be. Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but are we listening? Are we, are we obedient? The third question that that book asks, it says... And do we ever wonder why the Holy Spirit interventions are so rare among our congregations? Wonder why? I know the answer. It's us. It's us. Because I, I thought about the I thought about uh, you remember in Ezekiel? 
God led Ezekiel out and he showed him a valley full of dry bones. Remember that story? And he looked out over that valley and all these bones and this is this is where I wish I could Darla, how, how's the song the <laughs> leg bone connected to what? Y'all know that song? Okay, sing it, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> no? Don't want to hear me the leg bone, the leg bone connected to the knee bone, the knee bone connected to the thigh bone. We're going to have to Google that, but check it. But this valley, this valley full of bones. God told Ezekiel to prophesy and to. <clears throat> Those bones, they began to come together. And they began to stand upon their feet. But although they were there and the flesh was on them, they still lacked one thing, and they lacked life. But God breathed life into that valley, the dry bones. I wonder if maybe this, even this morning, that God does not need to breathe life in the Main Street United Baptist Church. That's not a bad thing. But life, spirit field, fire fields. Because I can honestly say, and, and, and I believe this, every, every aspect of our worship, spirit, worship service is guided by the Holy Spirit. I've often said this, and, 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 and I hope you know this, on Sundays especially, but any other day I preach, but on Sundays especially, I'm focused on the sermon. And even on Sunday morning, I'm still listening. I had a conversation not long ago with somebody, and they, they asked me, said, well, Mike, where, where do you get to your sermon? I used to tell them, well, I used to just Google uh, Charles Stanley and uh, repeat his, but I figured you'd catch on if I did that long. I can't explain that because I feel this all my life literally is about sermons. It's what I do. So I'm always listening. I'm always listening. Yes, yeah, some weeks I look at scripture and I, I know that God, God wants this particular scripture read, but then I also know that the sermon's out there somewhere. So until I step into the pulpit on Sunday morning, I don't know exactly where we're at. And I am honest enough to say this, many Sundays and most Sundays, if not all Sundays, I preach the same scripture at Mount Zion and Walnut Street and even here. <laughs> but I can tell you this, the message is not always the same. Why? Because of the Spirit. And it's important that we're obedient to that spirit of God because without, without that spirit, we can't do what we do. And I wonder if that might be the cause of why we don't see some of those things happen. And lastly, but not least, it said, could it be could it be that we're missing out on some wonderful blessings planned for our lives and our churches because we're not properly acquainted with the person and the work of God, the Holy Spirit? It's back to us, right? Could we, could we be the reason today that we're not filled with that Holy Spirit fire? And it could be. Could be because we become dry. We could be because it's become a routine. It could be today because Jesus is not real. It could be today simply because life's got you down. I get it. There's weeks I'm like that, Pastor. I don't want to be here. I'm that's almost a lie. That, I can't say that up here. I 
I want, I want, I want on Sunday morning, I want to be in God's house. I want to be with God's people. And I do know this, if God called me to preach, I got, I got to say yes, I can't say no. But that's Holy Spirit led. Where do you stand? Because you see, the great thing is, is simply this, and it was in the song. We're invited to the table, right? God today invites us to the table. You can turn in your hymnals to page 13 and 14 or somewhere in that facility. But we're invited to the table this morning. And you see, the great thing about the spirits on Pentecost that what? Everybody was invited. No one was excluded on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. So as we're invited to the table, which page number is it? Is it 13? It's just Charles' responses? Should be. Okay, don't need the whole thing, just need your responses, because my, mine's going to be different. We're spirit-led, we're spirit right? Christ be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Holy One. It is right, good, and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give your thanks to give our thanks to you who poured out tons of fire on the disciples at Pentecost. You promised to give your young people visions of a better world and your elders dreams of peace. All who are led by your spirit are your children. Join heirs with Christ in both suffering and glory. And so with your creatures on earth and all the heavenly chorus, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and holy is your child, Jesus, who sent the Holy Spirit to be with us so that we would not be left alone. On the night in which he gave himself up, Jesus took bread, broke it, saying, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the healing of the world. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of grain and grape, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be the body of Christ filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit for the healing of the world. Sender of dreams, spirit of truth, giver of visions, you are the one God to whom we offer our praise and our thanks. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught uh, his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> The cup today, which represents the body and the blood which was given for us, you should be able to peel back that top layer. The 
body which was given for you, for me, we take and eat in remembrance of that. The cup today which represents the blood of Christ, which was poured out for you, for me, for many, for the meant forgiveness of sins. We take and drink in remembrance of what Christ did for us. <coughs> as we continue to respond this morning to the Word of God, and as you think about the Holy Spirit fire, you look at this world in which we live I guess you might say there's a lot of scary things that we don't know we don't understand things are expensive we don't understand what happens here and there but I still believe this what God needs from us more now today than he has ever needed is for us to live this gospel Jesus is the only one today that can make a difference. And we need to be spirit-led as we stand, as we sing, what number? 328. 328. <laughs> dwelling place with you. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. With hearts afire and filled with new visions, let us go in peace to love and serve the world. Amen. Amen. <laughs>